So I've loosely titled this My Personal Archetypes, which has definitely been a path to a deeper creative well for me. And the question that I always get is how I chose my archetypes and how could you think about choosing archetypes? And frankly, even though I am, I was a psychology and religion major and I did graduate with a degree in the same, um, I ran a restaurant and I wanted to be an artist way more than I wanted to be a preacher. And so a long circuitous path led me to where I was in 2001. Divorced for a number of years, Zena was, uh, well, she was born in 87, so you can do the math. And feeling once again at loose ends, and I encountered this book, Sacred Contracts by Carolyn Mace. Uh, this is a very dense book. If this is new to you, I don't recommend at all that you jump into this book. You don't need to do that at this stage of the game. I read through it, and when I've read through it over the course of the years, I read it about every five years. And every time I read it, I understand more about all of it in the way that she envisions it. And we always want to remember, this is the disclaimer, that we are human beings trying to figure out the natural and organic and spiritual world around us, the energetic, to use her word, around us. And so I don't think of Caroline Mace who, as someone who has written something um, other than a really fascinating and profound guide to who we are as human beings. And this is not at odds with anyone's religious beliefs, it's not at odds with mine. If anything, it was an addition to how I under, began to understand the world. And as part of that, in the appendix of her book, she has 20 or 30 pages where she has identified a number of archetypes, quite a few, don't know exactly how many to be exact, but I'd say easily 70, maybe 60 or 70 archetypes that, that existed. Now keep in mind, this book was written in 2001. So yeah, she referenced films, as you can see on this spread, and fiction and past religion and mythological ideas, because of course, one thing she thinks, which I believe many of us understand better now, all of it is inextricably woven together based on the cultures that we come out of and the belief systems that we embraced when we were younger. But the world did not stop in 2001 when Caroline Mace published this book. It has continued and it's continued in, in of course, a way that is ever expanding as anything that's evolving does. And so we could rewrite this book or we could write another book that would have a whole new list of films and fiction and myths and ideas. And that is one of the things that I have found in my own life to be so fascinating about it is that it's ever expanding and was not, it's not static. So what I did after I read her book was to think for a pretty long time about reading back again through that, that appendix that she had. And here's the thing, she proposes, and I go along with the system because I think it, it's a good way to organize information. And as a teacher, if I've done anything over 25 years plus, it's learned how to organize information and help people think about variables even when everybody's approach is slightly different, the reality is that there's a structure that sort of fits over everything that helps us keep the parts in place. And so if we are willing to go with that structure that she proposed, which is what I still use when I outline CST, for example, it, it does make sense to me that we each have a child archetype. And within the child archetype, there are choices of the kinds of child archetype that you personally respond to the most. And so my natural inclination was to gravitate to the nature child. And so what I'm showing you first here is the set of cards that I made over a year ago that were taking my exploration of symbolism related to archetypes even further. So what I did easily 15 years ago was to keep reading through 
her book, her descriptions, there wasn't as much online as there is now. And I would caution you to be careful about what you're reading because now archetypes is one of those buzzwords that can be appropriated. And when it's appropriated, it can be used to support a marketing plan or it can be used to design a business model. And that's all I suppose well and good, but it, it's one step away from the sacred create, creative aspect of this, which is the most important thing to me, which is using your sacred creativity, what you do for yourself to explore all of this as a way of being more aware and in touch with who you are and what your preferences are and what you care about. And so I finally settled on, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 or 16 archetypes that seemed like they could be a good fit. And then over a longer period of time, probably three or four years, I finally whittled it down by trying each one on under different circumstances until easily 10 years ago, I, I pretty much had my 12, the four core archetypes that I'll show you first, and then the eight that are personal to my life. And I can talk more about how others come in and visit, but that isn't part of where we are right now. So this is my nature child card. And this particular card, I, I just thought I'd walk you through how I think about symbolism, because I think one of the things that can be helpful when you're, when you're in a class or you're studying with someone is to see how they approached the material so that it could give you an idea of how to approach your own discernment in this sense. So my cards are all the same size. And here's how I do it. There are certain birds and flowers and plants that I'm drawn to. And when one of those cycles back more than once, two times, three times, you know that when you, sometimes they say, well, if something happens to you twice, it's sort of like pay attention. And if it's third time, pay even more attention. It's sort of that feeling. But for the child, the way I thought about it was what did I, what was I drawn to as a child? And I was drawn to the birds. There was um, literally, a doctor that my parents took us to who had a koi pond. This was in central Ohio. I thought those koi were amazing. I could have watched them sort of languish and swim in the water for hours. In the back of this card, you can see it's actually a photo of a, a very large dandelion. I was, I was taken by those. The chickadee has, has, so I look this all up. Blue jays are seen as animals that represent intelligence, communication, and curiosity, mischief. And if those words don't describe a childlike approach, I don't know what does. The goldfish, several ancient stories and fairy tales include stories of goldfish granting wishes and making dreams come true. Chickadees are filled with curiosity. Once again, the cornerstone of creativity that's most directly linked to childlike curiosity and they are a source of positivity and joy. But that's not a chickadee, that's a titmouse. Oh, you're right, it is a titmouse. <laughs> that's so funny, thanks for pointing that out. Well, it should have been a chickadee, but titmice probably have a very similar sort of, just their energy is similar. Thanks, dang, I missed that. They show up at the same time at the feeder. <laughs> well, they're always outside together here, um, and they go back all the way to my childhood in Ohio. So now you, thanks, I'm gonna write this down and go look up the titmouse next. It's all related, thank you. At the same time, I was recognizing that I also had a magical child. And this is a fairy that was in a McDonald's uh, kids meal, pretty darn long time ago because Zena was, I got it in her meal and I absconded with it because it's the fairy from Cinderella. So it's whenever they re-released that movie, which I don't know when that was, but in any event, I love her. She sits on my kitchen window. She's been with me ever since. The hummingbird symbolizes joy, messages from spirits, and magical children surround themselves with imaginary friends and animals and love make-believe. And so I chose butterflies and in the back, it's a little bit uh, hard to see, but I have a, a pair of tigers that are carved out of some sort of a green 
rock. I don't even know what it is from Africa. And I keep those tigers with me and love to look at those as well. And so you'll have your own set. This is just sharing what mine are, but it gives you an idea of how to start thinking about it. Now we also each have a victim. People don't like the idea of that, but the victim is actually, remember archetypes have a light side and a shadow side. And the light side is the lesson that we have to learn. And it's a, it's, it's a, a, a lesson each of us learns. We each need to learn over the course of our lifetimes how not to be a victim because then we are victorious. So they are, this is the guardian of your self-esteem. And I definitely have felt like a victim in relationship to the world. And so you can see the globe behind the bird and you can see the candle. And I hope this is a canary, but in any event, this image referenced, the, the, the picture of the flame is mine. The bird is superimposed but it reminded me of the sacrifice of a canary in order to discern safety in a mine shaft and the fact that a candle can be snuffed out and the coins represent my own money fears and worries about being female and alone and victimized and unable to take care of myself. So sometimes when we put these elements together as I have done on these cards, it's because we need a reminder of where we don't wanna go of how we can lift into the light side by studying the dark side more closely. And you have probably noticed at this point that I have written, the way I made these cards is that I put all the images together and I photographed them and put them back in the computer and printed them out one more time. And then I wrote literally on the, the printout that I made. And so you see the writing, those are the words that I free associate to the particular archetype and right above the victim, there is the word victorious and not afraid and not tempted. The saboteur is the third protection of, of human development, guardian, sometimes we refer, refer to it that way and it is considered the guardian of your choice. So in this image, you see me holding myself close and feeling the golden light within. My choices are protected and I will not allow anyone to sabotage me, nor will I sabotage myself or someone else. The heron stands for autonomy and persistence and longevity. The daffodils signify new life and resilience because they are strong survivors who weather winter storms. And the dove is of course, devotion, navigation, grace, purity, gentleness, the qualities we need in order to hold, hold ourselves in the light side of the saboteur. The dark side of the shadow side of the saboteur is the things that we do that keep us from succeeding. And those include uh, perfection and not getting to a particular task and instead uh, procrastinating. And there are four or five others, qualities, aspects of, of behavior that keep us from reaching the choices that are important to us. And I have done some sabotaging of my own life. And so this is a, a good reminder of how to hold that golden light inside and keep that at bay. The prostitute is very emotionally charged as a word. People don't like this word. Um, it's because of course it is so deeply connected to the selling of, of, of a body in, in many cultures. But if we take the word outside of that context, what the prostitute is really there to do, the lesson of the prostitute is to protect your faith in yourself. So in this particular card, I have the compass. I have the cardinal. The cardinal, and this is a female cardinal, is a reminder to set your intentions. 
I have the railroad track, which is a picture I took not far from where I lived in San Antonio. And the, of course, the west, south, east, north element to remind me to keep my true north. And also a line from a Mary Chapin Carpenter song that the verse goes like this. I can tell by the way you're talking that the past isn't letting you go. There's only so long you can take it all on and then the wrongs got to be on its own. And when you're ready to leave it behind you, you'll look back and all that you'll see is the wreckage and rust that you left in the dust on the way to the Jubilee. Now, these are my eight cards, and these are the choices that I discerned that I recognized had been with me in crazy ways from an early age. And so if you're thinking about looking at your own archetypes, one of the clearest ways to know that you're making a choice or connecting to an archetype, this is true creatively for me, but it's, it's true on many other levels too, and of course, my, my main message is always about creativity and how this can be helpful. And certainly the rebel has helped me to protect along with the prostitute and the saboteur because they ride shotgun has helped me protect my creative impulses and my creative understanding of myself. So once again, we see the cardinal because once again, it's setting your intention and it's one thing to be a shadow rebel. It's one thing to be a rebel who chooses, if you see some of my writing there, to be generous and to be original and to be spirit-filled and to be stoic and to be joyful. I created the checkerboard because there are always two sides and I needed to remind myself to be a rebel on the side of good for the right reasons. I chose the sailboat in the top right hand, Edward Hopper painting turned into a stamp because of the thrill of feeling empowered. And there is a tiger lily in the background that you may not be able to make out quite, quite easily, but that represents wealth and pride. But because of its vibrant colors, it symbolizes positivity and confidence. I encourage you not to shy away from looking at archetypes that seem distasteful or weak in some way, because every one of these archetypes I have found, even though I didn't like the idea of it, what I learned from engaging with it has been extremely powerful in my own life. And that includes my damsel. My damsel was activated probably when I was in middle school and got braces for the first time. Yes, more than once. And heard my father telling the dentist that as long as my teeth were straight, it, pretty good shot that somebody would marry me. Didn't have anything to do with how smart I was or that I was pretty nice looking, which shouldn't matter. It was more about just how can we make sure that we do whatever we need to do as parents so that she'll get someone to take care of her Many of us have probably had some experience like that. In this particular card, the background is unhatched eggs from a nest that I found on the ground that had been abandoned. There is a sculpture, a picture from a sculpture I own by ceramic artist Dennis Smith, which is a house on a very precarious hill that is embedded with nails. The stones are straight out of the Bible and the telling of the stoning of women and represent for me vulnerability. But there's a double message to the damsel and that damsel, and that is that she can grow into being a queen. And so you see the Quan Yin, which is a, an image that I've repeated in these cards numerous times because Quan Yin is the goddess of compassion. And this is the kind of queen that I decided in my late 40s I wanted to grow into being. 
when I reached 65, I wanted to choose wisdom over vulnerability and over resentment and over regret. So there's a double message in my card because I wanted to grow into a queen of my own world and set healthy and clear boundaries. And you see there the threat posture of the swan. Next up is my gambler. And there's another version of the Kuan Yin, always present. The Matterhorn in the Alps is the background picture. I had the very, very good fortune to go to Switzerland and teach before everything shut down. And part of that trip involved being able to go up on the Matterhorn and witness that amazing splendor. There's no other word for it, the splendor of the natural world. But of course, Mountains represent the risk of mountain climbing. I was not a mountain climber, I was on a train. But of course we see the cards and that's a fairly standard um, representation of the gambler. But then we have the grasshopper and the grasshopper represents fearlessness, forward moving and thinking, longevity and leaps of faith. And the crow represents adaptability and cleverness and intelligence, teamwork and reciprocity, transformation and psychic abilities. And I included a line straight up the middle of the card with one line from another Mary Chapin Carpenter song, split the deck right in half. I'll play from either side. My mother card includes the best fortune I ever got from a cookie. You will be rewarded for being a good listener. The fullness and ripeness of the fruit Mary and the Kuan Yin, again, reminders of compassion and grace. And perhaps the most surprising element on this card is the turkey vulture there on the right. The turkey vulture actually is a symbol for cleansing, adaptability, patience, loyalty, community, protection, renewal, tolerance. And Stacy Couch, who has studied with Caroline Mace wrote, in spiritual terms, the sense of smell is synonymous with the gift of discernment. Vultures have an incredible sense of smell. They can ride the thermals and find things that are dead for them to clean up a mile away. But discernment is the ability to sniff out the truth and knowing right from wrong. It's sitting with guidance to attain understanding. To discern something is to look at it and to truly know the nature of it. And from the lightest, best possible perspective of mothering, this is what my goal was, to be the one to clean up, to be okay with it, not to resent it, to be adaptable, to keep renewing, to be tolerant, and to be protective. This is my guide, and you may or may not be able to notice that there is a very faint Kuan Yin in the background of this card too, in this area on the top right. These are the hills of Utah. This is a photo that I took when we were 2016 doing a, a tour for the Creative Strength Training book. I superimposed the victorious figure and the campfire and the smoke rings because the way I see a guide is that you go ahead of the tribe and you figure out some of the best paths through the rocks and crevices. And then you send up smoke signals in some symbolic form so that the other members can follow after you safely until you're all together again. I relish the role of the guide which is why I gave myself that exuberant posture. This is my artist card. You can see there I am, faintly in the background, just my profile. 
The passion flower represents the passion I feel for what I do. The circle represents everything that comes <clears throat> full circle and is completed. The baby shoes equal taking baby steps, but also following in the footsteps of others who have mentored and taught me. And the butterflies are mystery symbols and mean spiritual rebirth, transformation, change, hope, and life. This is my pioneer. The light bulb and the hands, of course, represent discovery and invention and ideas being held in my hands and studied and observed. I have a magnifying glass so that I can look more closely at ideas. And my magnifying glass wouldn't be complete without my little metal stamped nasty woman tag. The clock gives time for ideas to manifest. The compass seeks direction. And the crystal seeks insight. And there you see three of my books, and those represent the pioneer ideas that I am so pleased to have been able to share over the course of my career. And the stamp is from the Vatican, and the moon and stars create a path for the pioneer to follow. My last card is the judge. The Kingfisher has been a symbol of wisdom for me ever since I looked up the Kingfisher because when I lived in San Antonio for 17 years, a Kingfisher appeared in late March on the wire over the drainage ditch that I passed by in the morning when I went to get my coffee at that famous coffee shop, Exxon. And the Kingfisher was there for me like clockwork. I went home and looked it up because it seemed so remarkable. I found out kingfishers can actually live 25 years. And there was a very good chance I was seeing the same kingfisher coming back from up north somewhere every season. But in many cultures, the kingfisher literally is a symbol of wisdom. And in this case, the checkerboard represents two sides to every story, which is what helps a judge like me try to stay fair. The orb, the sun, the moon equals completion and fullness and fairness as well. And the iris is a symbol of faith, hope, courage, wisdom, and admiration. The purple iris in particular symbolizes wisdom. So sometimes we're working with archetypal patterns and symbolism and we don't even recognize it. It's like the cornerstones of creativity that I'm gonna talk about in February. It's like gravity, it's there, it's there. You're not making it happen, girl, neither am I. It was there all along. We just weren't ready to see it or understand it. So I just wanted to share a few pieces with you before we go to the Q&A of work of mine that was made long before I really understood anything about archetypes because at that point, all I'd ever had was a class in Jungian psychology in 1975 as I was reaching for my degree. So this piece is 97 and I won't go into a lot of detail of how they're made, but it's paste paper and clear transparencies layered over silk. And this was my rebel. And in 97, I did a large piece. This is just a detail. And this was my damsel. And I was working with a lot of symbolic elements. This piece, as was true of a number of pieces that I did, had thousands of straight pins <clears throat> embedded in the surface by putting a little drop of glue on the end of the pin and then pushing it through. And this also incorporated old dish towels and tea bags and sandpaper and even sandpaper that had been stitched on my loner Bernina. And once they realized I was doing this, I didn't get an invitation to borrow a Bernina and who can blame them? 
Another very early judge piece with the beloved Kingfisher image. 94, the victim. I thought it'd be really fun to paint Zena's body. She was about seven and have her do a body print. And then I realized I couldn't do her without doing me. So after I took her to school, I went back to the house. I lived alone, painted myself up with black paint and started to lay down on the white sheet that I was using, realized I wouldn't fit, I was too big. So I had to adopt this posture and add my face later. And all I could think is this, this represented what culture can do to women. And so I finished it as a quilt with these photocopies of stones and stitched the sticks that were stitched to the surface along with quilting that represented all the terrible words that people use in English when they're referring to women. And it was called sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And then completed this piece, which was my struggle with mothering. And again, a photocopy, large three, 11 by 17 um, A4s put together there with my, what has come to be known as my signature style of dying and screen printing. And in that case, the beautiful, beautiful heart that you see was drawn by Zena when she was maybe six. And I still have that silk screen. It's in my treasured collection. This was one of a series of 14 pieces that I did that were all archetypal in one way or another in 92 and involved lots of additional symbolism. They were all photocopy uh, portraits from, <clears throat> pardon me, copyright free images I, I had found of women in various cultures. Surrounded with stitching and beading and the use of thousands of brass safety pins that each had a couple of beads on them before they were attached to the fabric to create the texture that you see around this central image. And a self-portrait. Two thousand and six, my guide. By now, I had read Caroline Mace, and I was more aware. So these were actually intentional pieces with those topics. This is one of my Quan Yin's, a photograph set into uh, one of my dyed backgrounds with paper lamination. Another piece, this time the guide, but you can see the smoke rings there in another version, and. Uh, obviously much more abstract. The piece on the left, the, the, the horizontal bars has a map printed onto it that you can't really discern um, in this image, but the, the writing on the right and the map and the smoke rings were all um, elements that I chose intentionally to use on, on this whole series. The smoke rings were needle felted using an embellishing machine. Similar piece, this is the judge. And the gambler, you see that red line once again, cut the deck right in half, I'll play from either side. The child, just a detail. But on each of the pieces in this particular series, I included handwriting, which was the mantra that I adopted after I read Caroline Mace's work, which you can see there handwritten around the hummingbird. Stay in present time, seek only the truth, surrender your will to God. Love is the only true power, honor yourself, honor others, all is one. The nature child, this again is mainly needle felting. And the mother, needle felting the black line over silk noel. The saboteur, again, needle felting, this is quite a large panel.
and another version of the judge. Again, with my Kingfisher. Flower paste crackle in the background. And I wrote some of the words that I'd come up with when I free associated into the flower paste crackle. Two young friends, children of a, another friend of mine agreed because of popsicles to do these body prints. This was a three panel piece that I did in 2008 for an exhibition in the UK. And this was called um, A Prayer for the Children and the Flowers. The flowers are all um, photocopy transfers that have been hand colored with um, Dynaflow, the very thin version of fabric paint. And all of my fabrics were um, manipulated and dyed. And then the two panels the kids are on were discharged. Two thousand ten, the guide. Once again, map images I had been using um, over three or four years' time, and this bird, which I've used a number of times, as another symbol of of my guide. Two thousand eleven, I was very involved with spoonflower and took kind of a detour there, but the themes are still the same. They just present themselves in different ways. And part of the reason that I wanted to include this part of the presentation was so that you will feel that no matter how you're working, whether you're representational or you're figurative or you're abstract, there are ways to embrace these elements in yourself that can, as, ha as, as has happened with me, deepen the work that you do. And the final slide, my rebel created the Spoonflower piece. And it was at that point pretty much same old, same old. So I laid it down on the floor, got up on a ladder and dropped paint on it. And if nothing else, this is for me at least indicative of how we're treating the world around us, the natural world with a great deal of um, indignity and indifference. Thank you for being here. Any questions or comments? I'm happy to, I'm ha happy to, to, to guide you or to answer something that you may have a question about or welcome whatever you would like to share. We have about, uh, shoot, we got about 15 minutes left at least. So if you need to go, feel free, feel free to go. I, I don't wanna keep anybody here when I know how busy you all are, but a little conversation at the end is always a nice way to, to get closure as far as I'm concerned. Shelley. Hola, Dutch Bella. Uh, <laughs> you know, this was really lovely. Thank you. Because um, even though I participated in the program last year, the whole archetype thing just wasn't resonating. Mm -hmm. And I think that I was just having a really hard time with with thinking about it. And part of it was just what was going on in my own life. But um, no, it's, it's really neat to see how those elements came together. And I, I love your emphasis on the fact that all of these archetypes have a light side along with the, uh, the dark or the shadow side. And so not to get hung up on the words, mm -hmm. but to really understand the spirit of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, so that's very helpful for me. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Shelly, because you know, here's the thing, let's just look at the prostitute for a minute. Mm -hmm. I waited tables for years and I did it for the money. I was yeah. in the restaurant business and I was very clear why I did it. And lots of us have done jobs that we knew very clearly in our heart of hearts were only there to pay the bills. And that's the light side of the prostitute, recognizing that you have enough faith in yourself 
that you can do what you did or what yeah. you're doing and be okay with it. The whole bottom line of all of this study, if it's worth anything at all, it's that you know why you're doing enough that you're never beating yourself up about the choices that you make. Great, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I, I just think it's important to point that out because that's one of the stickiest ones to unravel because we can't get away from the sex element of it, especially I think, let's face it, as, as women. But it isn't really about that. It's about, do you understand why you're doing what you're doing and are you gonna be okay with it? And somebody can be prostituting like I was, going and waiting tables and being nice to people to get that $20 tip. I knew why I was doing it. Sure. And I was totally- and You know, we all have, well, first of all, in my experience is, is that it takes money to live on this earth. <laughs> so, you know, we all have things that we do because, because we need to, mm -hmm. to put food on the table and pay the rent. Right. Um, but yeah. after that, then it's really the question of, you know, am I making this for, because it feeds me or because I think this is what somebody wants to buy? Right. And that's where I think it's so important that we have these conversations because it can help us see more clearly when we can put one thing aside and move on to the next stage instead of being stuck there. Oh, amen. I would be the poster child for that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Susan, thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, boy, did that just speak to me. Uh, you may have waited tables, but I was a legal assistant in a very large law firm um, with people I did not really agree with politically. Uh, there was a hierarchy of who was most important and who you kissed the ass of. And I knew I was there for the money and I was grateful for the money and all the benefits I got. And it also afforded me to leave at 64 and retire and say, ta-ta, mm -hmm. I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. I had uh, a coworker telling me that she wasn't paid enough money to do this job. And I'm thinking, yeah, you are. And you're getting paid per hour and you do what they ask you to do, you know? So anyway, my... <laughs> That just really rang home with me. Um, I, my one question was, do you have references to help us with symbolism? I do. And um, I think it's one of the, I, Zena was going to be here for a little while. I don't know whether she's still here now, but in the, Zena, are you here? She, she's busy. Anyhow, in the packet of introductory materials we provide, I'm pretty sure there's a mm -hmm. guide there's a guide to thinking about all this and where to look for symbolism. I know it exists. I'm not sure it's been shared yet, Susan. So okay, great. I'll check with her and see, but there is, um, it's a PDF that you can download. Obviously you can just look at it online, but it has website links for flower symbolism and birds and animals. And, but you know, even if you can't find that right away, you can Google it. That's what I did. And it all comes up. And, and so that, and, and there are books too. I think there may have to actually be a bibliography with that too that would be helpful. So I'll double check with her to see where that is and how soon people can access it. But it's, I definitely wrote it and it's there. It's great. There. Thank you. It's there now. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank can you. Can you hear me now? I have to say that uh, this is year two for me and I really did flounder in year one, uh, almost quit, uh, but decided to stick with it and try to grab hold of some of the information and make sense of it. So I'm hoping this year I can work a little more diligently and get more from it and understand myself even greater. Thank you. Yes, Susan, I'm glad you're here. Where, where exactly is this uh, information available? I see Zena's here now. Zena, could you address that? Yeah, can you hear me? I think I was having like microphone issues. Oh. Yeah, so it's it when you log in, if you're a, a part of CST 2022, uh, when you log in, you'll see a button that says getting started. And there are quite a few documents there. And I think what you were referring to with the image sources and um, and building your visual language is part of the building your archetype deck document. Yes, you're right. Yeah. And that's there. That That is um, in the, the little member area of the website. Okay, thank you, Zena. Beverly, glad you're here. 
let's just stop. Hi, Jane. I'm absolutely loving all of it. However, I'm feeling a bit out of the depth with the archetype cards. Uh, yours are absolutely amazing. And I'm not, a, I don't know, it's, I'm struggling to think how I could produce something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't have to make them this week, Beverly. We've got time here. We're going okay. to go along. You know, I'm not going to. Here's one thing I don't do. I don't trick people and say, well, you can't really be in CST if you don't have your cards done by March 1st. Okay. Okay. If you do, one, just, one, you do look amazing. And I have kind of started listening to uh, the 12 days of archetypes that you did and writing things down. But I can write it down, but I can't kind of get in my head how I'm going to transfer that to a picture on the card. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't do drawing or pictures. I'm, I sew, I do textiles, but I don't draw. Yeah. And you know what? There are plenty of people who never make cards. That's just, the, that's just where I went. There okay. Are, there are other people, you know, um, if you go back through the catalog that's online, Look, look at Kristen Rohr's work. Hers is totally abstract stitching. And yet it means she tells in her artist statement how, an, how the archetypes influenced her with the stitching that she did. Okay, so who was that? Her name is Kristen Rohr. Kristen Rohr, okay. If you go and you look at Lynn Bainbridge's work in the catalog, they're paintings and they're, ab they're beautiful abstract paintings and she describes what she started to see as she was painting. So this isn't meant to say there's only one way to go about this. Those are just a couple examples that come to my mind. You know, there, but if you if if this is is new to you and you haven't looked or you would like to look again at that catalog that we did in December, it is online and it's free. It's on my website. And yeah. if you do that after having listened to me today, it might make a lot more sense for you and you can begin to see how what you yourself do right now can translate into uh, something that, that's relating to what we're talking about without being like my, my work. Yeah. Be, it's all over the place. And that's why those shows are so much fun to do is because it's all over the place. Okay. And each of us has our own distinctive way we are gonna manifest these ideas. And you know what, whatever you're doing, guess what, you've already got an A. Okay. It's really strange because I was having a conversation with a friend last night who doesn't do anything arty, and yet I mentioned archetype to her, and she's a pagan, and straight away she was like, blur, all this history and everything coming out about archetypes. I'm like, oh, wow, <laughs> too much information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, she says this is nothing new this is historical I'm mm -hmm. like okay okay mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah there's a lot to look into yeah and it isn't anything new and that's a beautiful thing about it it's got some weight and some history behind it but yeah. there is something a little bit new about how we're looking at it in terms of how it can impact us from a creative perspective yeah that's yeah. Really our focus in this particular community okay so, thanks thank, for thank you Thank you, Jane. Welcome. Mary. I just want to say what a treat it was to see that body of work on those cards over the years and how you grew and developed with them and using the symbolism. I just thought it was very helpful, but fun and just really wonderful to see them all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for commenting. Thank you. I'm glad I could share them because, you know, some of this stuff, you do it for yourself, but it is really, um, it's very satisfying to share it and have it go full circle. But it's very personal. And thank you for sharing that. You're very welcome, Mary. Thank you. Teresa. You're welcome. Hi, Jane. Thank you so much for sharing. It, really beautiful. Um, my question is like when we start, um, with the archetypes, are we going to start with the four that everybody has, or are we just going to kind of put those aside and we should work on those on our own, or how is that going to work? 
Well, we always start with the child because everybody's got one and it's the least threatening one. Okay, thank you. And then the other three are interspersed across the course of the year. The okay. way when I wrote CST, I had a logic to my madness. Okay. And I, I developed it, I developed the whole idea in, in a series of steps. And I still follow that outline for the whole year. Okay. So sometimes a particular archetype fits in based on what the other basic precepts that we're talking about are. Okay. So eventually we'll hit on the prostitute and the saboteur, mm-hmm. and, um, but they, I don't, I don't, I, they're not the first lineup. Okay. I just, I just kind of wanted to get an idea so that I can start thinking. It takes me a while to get my brain moving. Yeah. Lately. yeah. Well, that's the beauty of having a whole month to think about any one of them is that since I was introduced them the first of the month, and then we talk about them in a meeting on the second of the month, second uh, Wednesday, Mm -hmm. there's some time to consider this and kind of, um, I I know I need time to process. Yeah, I do. Set it up is so is to give as much time to people to be able to process as possible. Although I'm still processing and I'm 22 years into this. So there you go. Do you recommend us? Well, do you recommend like a specific size for the cards or like, you know, I don't know. It doesn't matter. I don't think it does. Okay. I think it does. I made mine um, a, a, a size that I could handle so that oh, I could okay. go through them and look at them. Okay easily but other Mm -hmm. people have done all kinds of other things and that that that's something that you can think about what what feels most comfortable to you is the way to answer Mm -hmm. that question thank you of course joyce hi jane it's always great to be back one of the questions that i have is the software that you use or you use to make your cards um what software do you use um well I use PicMonkey to drop backgrounds out of things. And then I use Keynote, which is the presentation software that I use. And what I do is I, I build the, the image on the Keynote screen, and then I screenshot it, and that's how I capture it. So I'm not using Photoshop elements or I'm not using anything complicated because I'm not a complicated kind of girl. I don't, I don't have the brain for it but I took a couple of keynote programs so that I could do online lectures. And then I realized that as long as I could screenshot what I built, I could do almost anything in keynote. And so that's what I do now. Okay, and keynote's pretty easy to use. Keynote's a Mac program. So you do have to have a Mac in order to, keynote's kind of the equivalent of PowerPoint on a PC. Oh, okay. But it's a real, if you have a Mac, it's a really robust program. I just love it. I could. I don't know if it was human, I would marry it. <laughs> I'm sure Wayne is not happy with that. Uh, well, or maybe we can think of Wayne as my, my human version of Keynote. Really? Yeah. Um, and I have a PC, so I'll try it in PowerPoint because I. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, think you kind of you know, I think you can, I think you can actually get a Keynote program for a PC. You might just look into it. Okay, I will do that. And pick monkey. You t- you talked about that in the first year. Yeah, so I always put that down as a program. And if you're going to really get the most robustness out of PicMonkey, like dropping out backgrounds, you are going to have to um, subscribe. You can't use the free version because they're always hiding things behind a new firewall in order to get you to pay. Unfortunately. Yeah. But it's Do not actually know- expensive. Do you know about how much PicMonkey is? I think. Unless they're running a special, it might be around $99 a year. I don't really know. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Karen, welcome. We've got a few more questions. I know we're coming up and I see some people are leaving. If you need to leave, feel free. I understand that. And thanks again for being here. Karen, you're up. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much. A big part of the reason I wanted to do this is to... Um, find community. Um, I live in a rural area. I'm recently retired. And so I just want everyone to know how exciting it is to me to see all your faces. Um, I used to sing in a church choir that 
faced the congregation. And the greatest joy in that, aside from the singing, was that I could sit the whole time and just look at everyone's faces. Um, I, I don't know, it was really meaningful to me. So that, that may be the most important thing that happens this year for me. Um, but I also wanted to say, we are in the middle of sort of rearranging things in our house. And so my, this has been great motivation because my little studio space is uh, kind of cluttered right now. And I have March 1st deadline <laughs> to get things sort of in their place so that I can actually have some clarity. Um, but that's all, I just wanted to share that appreciation. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks, thanks for being <laughs> brave and stepping up and saying so. You're reminding me and the, the, the shadow side of that, what you're describing is the one time I was giving a lecture and I was really ill suited to be giving the lecture to this very, very traditional, this was a pretty long time ago. And it was also after dinner. And so there were four women sitting in the front row. And as I was talking, they all started to nod off and they were all leaning forward and, and starting to go to sleep. And I talked faster and faster and faster and faster. And finally I left, left out the last part of my talk altogether because I was afraid one of them was gonna fall asleep and crash <laughs> on the floor and get hurt and disrupt the whole meeting. And that's when I realized that I had to be a wiser woman when it came to choosing what sort of guilds would actually enjoy having me there mm -hmm. and not think I was just as boring as all get out. So it can go both ways. Yes, believe me, I watched a lot of people nodding off in church. <laughs> It wasn't when you were singing. I know that. No, well, I hope not, but. <laughs> That's cute. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Jane. I loved your, um, your demo that you showed of your cards. It's always nice to see a platform of a thing made because I've taken classes and people will say, we'll do this, this, and this, and we're, we don't see the end result until the end. But it was really nice to see your whole platform of the architect cards. I'm on the third year with you. And I will tell you that I've been doing architect cards for a long time, collage cards. So my simple advice to people who have a hard time getting into this is to maybe choose a theme, a color, images. And, and I was also moving three times during this program. And my studio was a mess. So one of the things my suggestion was I created a, a simple card deck in that I just took magazines and I just threw the images on. And it was a simple process, you know, like it's just a little card and you can just throw your images on. And that way you have a platform to go to the next step. Because if you don't have time to do the drawing and all these things, you could at least take magazines and rip them up and put them on a piece of paper, label it mother, whatever. And I have tons of cards. So my next project will probably be merging those cards into paintings. But that that was my suggestion for the archetype cards. And I don't think I've ever, um, you know, talked about it. So I just wanted to pass that on to the newcomers. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. And for those of you who were able to attend the retreat on Sunday, um, Cheryl Broswell did a stunning, stunning presentation on how she's done a similar thing with magazine pictures and painting into them and collaging from that perspective. And it might be that I can um, see if she'd be interested in letting me use her presentation at some point and share it with a larger public because it was, was very, very inspiring along the same lines of what you're suggesting, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Time for Kate and Esther. I was delighted to see all of these cards a second time. I've, I've seen them before and I'm thinking about the archetypes and what the symbolism, but it always sort of escaped me because, well, this last year was a little bit ragged. There, was, there were an awful lot of things happening. And um, it didn't, it set off a bunch of things. I've, I've written down the names of some of the different things that you referred to, some of the different symbols that you referred to saying, oh, I gotta go find out more about that. Oh, that might be useful. Oh, I didn't know that. And I didn't make cards because I, I couldn't access that part of my experience in the last year, but I, I, might, I might try that now. Um, 
I, I love the idea of layering all the images, but I think I might wind up actually making the images and having it be textural and not flat in the end. But I was delighted to see them again. Thank you. Welcome. You're welcome. And a, a stitched set or there's so many di different directions this can go, Kate, like what you're saying. Yeah. And yeah. that that's the thing. This is it's not even a jumping off place. It's just like, hey, look what I did now. You go do your own. Yes, it just sees. Yeah, so cool. Thanks. I'm glad you were here. Esther. Hi, Jane. Um, hi. Yeah, just just to, I'm just slightly confused because I'm a complete newbie to this. So it's my first year with you. And um, I'm really excited about the archetypes. They sound amazing. But I'm just a bit, um, I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Should I try and look at them all before I start with you in March and sort of have a go? Should I wait for you to describe each one as you go like month by month and then try and make a cars month by month of you? Okay, Esther, here's what we're gonna do everybody right now. One, two, three, take a deep breath. You can't possibly figure this out before you meet up with me, Esther. And part of the reason you're with me is so you don't have to. Now what you could do, but only if it's fun. I refuse to make an assignment that won't sound like fun, that will just make people, I can see Kevin smiling right now, that's just gonna make you nervous. You gotta lighten up on yourselves with this stuff. If you're completely new to it, it's gonna come over time, but think of it, don't think of it as a tsunami bearing down on you. Think of it as a, the most pleasant brook that you can just dip your toes in and the water feels so perfect. It's exactly the right temperature. And the little goldfish come up and they nibble on your toes and give you ideas. And you're just in the most beautiful place with it. And it's going to evolve over the whole year. So my best advice would be that if you can get your, you don't have to buy a copy of Caroline Mace's book there, that's not required. But if you go to her and we can include this, it, it, it's probably somewhere, but her last name is spelled M-Y-S-S, -S, even though it's pronounced Mace. And it's MYSS.com. If you go and look for her appendix of archetypes, and you just start reading through it like you're reading fairy tales. You know, how many of us have read fairy tales and suddenly we related to one of the characters? I know I always related to Snow White and Rose Red who were two sisters who saved a prince who'd been turned into a bear from a gnome who was a nasty little bastard. And I always saw myself that way. And my sister Anne was Rose Red. I was Snow White, but I drifted, but that's a different story. But in any event, if you're interested in going and reading about those and seeing whether any of them resonate with you, then you could just jot down a list of ones that feel like maybe they feel kind of good. And then once we get underway officially with this, we'll start giving you strategies to hone in on which ones, how to decide whether it's this or whether it's that. Was I a guide or was I a teacher? I'm not really a teacher, I'm a guide, and here's why. So I don't want anyone to start thinking that you're out of place or that you're not gonna fit in here or you can't possibly figure this out. This isn't only you, Esther, you've just given me a great opportunity to say it to everyone. Because over the course of the 10 months that I actually share an archetype every month, it's not necessarily one that you're going to relate to or feel like you've got it. It's just one that I, I, I cherry picked when I made my list in December of what I wanted to talk about next year. So we're gonna talk about the engineer because Linda Dawson asked me to talk about the engineer next year and I haven't written about it yet, but that doesn't mean everybody here has an engineer. It's just, so there's, there's part of what we're studying that broadens our understanding in, in, a, in one way, but then it's up to us to start personalizing it on our own with help from the discussions that we have together. Does that help Esther? 
Yeah, it does, yeah, thank you. Sorry if I got went to complete panic mode so for a moment. I think it was just the thought of thinking, am I supposed to have 12 archetype cards done before we start in March? <laughs> no, absolutely not. And me. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to point out something else about how we work here. When Zena was growing up, stupid was a bad world, word. It was just like shit. You didn't say it. You didn't say stupid. You could get in trouble. Sorry is on that same list. Okay. We're not going to say sorry. Because there's no reason to be sorry. If you didn't understand something, you didn't understand. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty, pretty much cut and dried. And if we weren't that kind of loving community, we wouldn't all be here together. So we're never going to think anything is stupid. And we're never going to ever say sorry. We're going to say maybe we didn't understand. Or maybe something happened and whatever, fill in the blank. But we don't have to be sorry about anything. You're here for a reason. And I don't know what that is yet. But we're going to figure it out together. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, Jane. One more comment, Beverly, and then people need to get to their afternoons or evenings in the case of my UK folks like you. Hello. In regard to what Esther was just saying, I've got the book, which I find pretty hard going. I've just gone to the back. I've got an, a marker pen. And as I'm reading through the archetypes, if anything resonates with me, I'm just highlighting it. And then when I've gone through them all, I'll then kind of make some more sense out of it. But that was how I found the easy way to do it. Otherwise I would forget because I've got a bad memory <laughs> as well. So yeah. that, that, that's how I'm just doing it at the moment. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to go about it. And yeah, try and make some sense of it later on. Yeah. Makes me think you might have an engineer. Yeah, well, maybe. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Linda Dawson. Yeah, just one last comment. Uh, 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 piggybacking on what you said about, I used to work for a man, and we, we never had a failure in that job. We always learned a lesson of what not to do next time, but we never failed at anything. So I, that's been, always been one of the things that I've carried with me. I, you know, when that word F starts to come up, I say to myself, mm -mm, you just learn what not to do next time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Or sometimes you learn what you want to do next time. Mm -hmm. Could go both ways. So thank you. Thanks for that wisdom. Okay, well, we're wrapping up now. And we didn't, it, it got a little chaotic the other day. I wanted to, to end with a yay. And a yay is, is the way we pray when we're at my house. And we've got a lot of non-denominational different people from different backgrounds. And I always used to close down my real life workshops with a yay where we would stand and actually hold hands and shout one, two, three, yay. But I'm gonna initiate that this year as a way to end because it's such positive energy. So I'd like you to join me in a yay right now in the privacy of your own home. And I'm gonna to count to three and then yay with me and have a great afternoon. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for being here. One, Thank two, you. three. Yay! Yay! yay. yay. <laughs> okay, talk to you Bye. soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.